Hello friends. Seems like uh, it's been a minute since I recorded you know, a, a video. I've been uh, you know, traveling. I went over to Israel for three weeks and it was wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that I'll uh, post some videos about that in the, in the future. But you know, today I wanted to talk about something that is going to be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And it's just how it is. <laughs> and so to kind of breach this, this subject, I want to lead in with some congressional hearings that have recently occurred. And I mean, they're talking about extraordinary things in the in these video clips of this hearing. And I want you just to listen to what these men are saying to before Congress, they have been sworn in. So what they're talking about, they're doing so under the penalty of perjury. And the things that they are talking about, I mean, not only are they shocking, but if they're true, they're game changers. So I want you to listen to what these folks are saying, and then I'm I'm going to come back and and just share some thoughts with you about this, and you know have a little you know announcement. You know, actually, I've, I finished my my book on Enoch, and I want to talk about it in conjunction with what these people are talking about because you know. It's this congressional hearing could not be more timely. So, so have a listen, see in a few. Several months ago, my office received a protected disclosure from Eglin Air Force Base indicating that there was a UAP incident that required my attention. I sought a briefing regarding that episode and brought with me Congressman Burchett and Congresswoman Luna. Uh, we asked to see any of the evidence that had been taken by flight crew in this endeavor and to observe any radar signature uh, as long as, to, as well as to meet with the flight crew. We were not afforded access to all of the flight crew. And initially, we were not afforded access to images and to radar. Thereafter, we had a bit of a discussion about how authorities flow in the United States of America, and we did see the image. And we did meet with one member of the flight crew who took the image. The image was of something that uh, I am not able to attach to any human capability, either from the United States or from any of our adversaries. And I'm somewhat informed on the matter, having served on the Armed Services Committee for seven years, having served on the committee that oversees DARPA and advanced technologies for several years. Um, when we spoke with the flight crew, and when he showed us the photo that he'd taken, I asked why the video wasn't engaged why we didn't have a FLIR system that worked. Here's what he said. They were out on a test mission that day over the Gulf of Mexico. And when you're on a test mission, you're supposed to have clear airspace, not supposed to be anything that shows up. And they saw a sequence of four craft in a clear diamond formation for which there is uh, a radar sequence that I and I alone have observed in the United States Congress. One of the pilots goes to check out that diamond formation and sees a large floating, what I can only describe as an orb, again, like I said, not of any human capability that I'm, that I'm aware of. And when he approached, he said that his radar went down, he said that his FLIR system malfunctioned, and that he had to manually take this image um, from one of the lenses, and it was not automatic automated uh, in collection, as you would typically see in a test mission. So uh, I guess I'll start with Commander Fravor. In, how should we think about the fact that this craft that was approached by our pilot uh, had the capability of disarming a number of the sensor and collection systems on that craft? Well, I think this goes to that national security side, and you can go back through history of things showing up at certain areas and disabling our capabilities, which is disheartening. And for us, I mean, like I said, it, it completely disabled the radar on the aircraft when it tried to do it. And the only way we could see it is passively, which is how he got that image. 
So I think that's a, that's a concern on what are these doing, not only how do they operate, but their capabilities inside to do things like this. Um, a few questions for Mr. Favor. As an expert naval aviator, have you ever seen an object that looked and moved like the Tic Tac UAP? No. Did the Tic Tac UAP move in such a way that defied the laws of physics? The way we understand them, yes. Many dismiss UAP reports as classified weapons testing by our own government, but in your experience as a pilot, does our government typically test advanced weapon systems right next to multi-million dollar jets without informing our pilots? No, we have test ranges for that. Do you believe that officials at the highest levels of our national security apparatus have unlawfully withheld information from Congress and subverted uh, our oversight authority? There are certain elected leaders that had more information that I'm not sure what they've shared with certain Gang of Eight members or et cetera, but uh, certainly uh, I would not be surprised. Okay. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. Um, <laughs> if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and you may or may not be able to answer my last question, and maybe we get into a skiff at the next hearing that we have, but who in the government either, what agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. Super. Mr. Graves, again, I'd like to know, um, how do you know that these were not our aircraft? Some of the behaviors that we saw in a working area, we would see these objects uh, being at 0.0, .0 Mach, that's zero airspeed, over a certain pieces of the ground. So what that means, just like a river, if you throw a bobber in, it's going to float downstream. These objects were staying completely stationary in category four hurricane winds. These same objects would then accelerate to supersonic speeds, 1.1, 1.2 Mach, uh, and they would do so in very erratic and, and quick behaviors that we don't, I don't have an explanation for. Okay. Have you spoken to um, commercial and military pilots um, that have seen these off of our East Coast? I have. Mr. Favor. What, what astonished you the most about the, the flight capabilities of these Tic Tac, very briefly? Uh, the performance. Absolute performance. It was... And, and you're, you're not aware of any other objects that anybody in the world has, in this world, that has those capabilities? No, I think it's far beyond, actually, our material science that we currently possess. Mr. Grush, thank you for being here, brother. Thank you all very much. Um, have you faced any retaliation or reprisals for any of your testimony or anything on these lines? Yeah, uh, I have to be careful what I say in detail because there is an open uh, whistleblower reprisal investigation on my behalf, and I don't want to compromise that investigation by, by providing anything that may uh, help provide somebody <laughs> information. But it was very brutal and uh, very unfortunate, some of the tactics they used to um, hurt me both professionally and, and personally, to be quite frank, yeah. It's very unfortunate, as they say, when you're over the target, that's when they do the most fi firing at you. Do you have any personal knowledge of people who have been harmed or injured in efforts to cover up or conceal these extraterrestrial technology? Yes. Personally. Have you heard, have anyone been murdered that you would think, that you know of 
or have heard of, I guess? I have to be careful asking that question. I directed people with that knowledge to the appropriate authorities. Maybe in a, um, if we could get, it, get in a um, confidential area of SCIF, we could talk about that. But unfortunately, um, we were denied access to the SCIF, and that's very unfortunate in this, in this scenario. Um, Mr. Favor, do you believe that you witnessed an additional object under the water in relation to your encounter? I will say we did not see an object. There was something there to cause the white water, and when we turned around, it was gone, so there was something there that obviously moved. Okay, it was, it was not the same object, though, that you were, you were looking at, correct? No, we actually joked that the Tic Tac was communicating with something when we came back and could, because the white water disappeared. Uh, we were, in, in another instance, we're told about the capabilities of, of a jamming during viewing of some, when there were some people chasing some of these objects. Did you experience any of that jamming or interrupting your radar or weapon system? My crew that launched after we landed experienced significant jamming to the APG-73 radar, which was what we had on board, which is a mechanically scanned, very high-end uh, system prior to the APG-79. And yes, it did pretty much everything you could do, range, velocity, aspect, and then it <coughs> spit the lock, and the targeting pod is passive. That's what we were able to get the video on. I'm about to run out of time, but um, are you aware of any of our enemies that have that capability? No. Okay. <laughs> Pretty wild, huh? So, I mean, what these men are talking about is the stuff of myth and legend. I mean, it's the stuff that conspiracy theories are based on. And yet we have these men whom are all credible, who have all worked for the government. And again, were, were sworn in under oath before they shared what they shared under penalty of perjury sharing incredible things that challenge reality as we know it. Well, why did I want to lead, start this video out with these congressional hearings, uh, these witnesses from this congressional hearing? Well, it's because I finished my Book of Enoch and the Book of Enoch reads like a conspiracy theory. There's no there's no getting around that. But so do these congressional hearings. And the fact of the matter is, is that if this is true, what these people are talking about in these hearings, if it really is true, well, the Lord has told us that all truth can be circumscribed into one great whole, and it will have to fit in with everything else. There has to be a place for this, you know, in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And of course, there absolutely is. And I have hinted and tiptoed around some of these things in my other books. I mean, you cannot read my other books without having come away with the distinct impression that Michael Rush believes that we are not alone in the universe and that there is intelligent life out there. Well, now that I have finished the Book of Enoch, well, actually, I haven't finished it. <laughs> I have analyzed the first um, 38 chapters through the second verse of chapter 38, actually. And I had to stop because the book is already um, 365 pages long. It's the longest book that I have ever written. I've included over 50 you know, illustrations and photographs in this book. I have not done that in other books. Unfortunately, as a result of that, it's made it far more expensive than my other books. It's about 50% um, more expensive. Uh, I could have shrunk down the, uh, the text and made the book shorter. I did that in A Remnant uh, Shall Return, if you've read that one. And uh, I've had so many people complain about how small that font is that I didn't do it in this book. And this book is longer than A Remnant Shall Return. So um, I apologize for the fact that this book will be um, more expensive than any other book that I've written. But it's also because of the nature of the book, the length of the book and you know, the content, the, the images within it. Um, now, 
I, I want to share with you a passage out of Luke. And this passage comes out of Luke 21. And this goes, I believe, hand in hand with these congressional hearings, with what these folks are talking about. And it also goes hand in hand with the book of Enoch. And I'll explain that. But this is coming from Luke chapter 21. And it's talking about what is going to happen in the last days. Uh, it talks about some of the signs, but it talks about what is really going to cause the issues in the last days. And I want you to listen to these things in the context of what you have just heard in Congress, because these testimonies that we've heard in Congress, um, they are not the only ones that are out there. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you read the 2023 uh, Congressional uh, Intelligence Memorandum, there's a section in there where the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee is expressing their great frustration with the Department of Defense for slow walking the explanation of what is going on in our skies. And you can hear the Senate fuming over the fact that what they call transmedium craft, or, you know, which is defined as a craft that can travel through the vacuum of space into an atmosphere and the challenges that are surround, you know, atmospheric travel, and then going into the oceans and traveling through those all the same crafts doing these things and doing them in ways that defy, you know, our understanding of the laws of physics. And, you know, it's, it is clear that the answers that the government understands these things more than what has been shared with the public. And it's, it is causing the people on the Senate Intelligence Committee to be very concerned, um, and you know, thus you're starting to have some some of these congressional hearings like this, where they're going outside of the DO, uh, the Department of Defense, to get some of these answers. But listen to Luke, these verses out of Luke 21. <clears throat> and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> you know, what Luke is saying. And when you consider Luke's words outside of the conversation that has been had in the halls of Congress, it doesn't make much sense. But in conjunction with that, it makes a heck of a lot more sense. And I'll tell you what, when you understand what the Book of Enoch is actually talking about, which again sounds like, you know, a nonstop conspiracy theory, you know, to, you know, the next level conspiracy theory, um, if you can set all these, you know, inherent biases that we have for talking about things like this, I mean, this has been instilled within us for, you know, decades now that you just don't talk about these things. And if you do, you're crazy. Well, you know, the Book of Enoch talks about this. And not only that, it, it says that these things are gonna happen. It says that this is going to be part of the challenges of the events that take place in the last days. In fact, in the first chapter of the book of Enoch, Enoch states that it's actually a scribal note for someone who has read the book of Enoch, but they, this scribe inserted this into the text you know, very early on because every copy of the book of Enoch that we have discovered um, and now including those that we found in the Dead Sea Scroll, we've got, you know, over a hundred ancient manuscripts of the Book of Enoch, uh, many of them written in ancient Aramaic, which precedes uh, Paleo-Hebrew, meaning this book is ancient. 
and the scribal note is there. And the scribal note simply states that Enoch wrote these things for the benefit of the elect who would be living on the earth during the days of tribulation, and that it was meant to bless them. In other words, said it another way, the book of Enoch was written to be a survival guide for us in the last days. And the things that it talks about are crazy. <laughs> you know, if you look at the 60th chapter of the book of Enoch, for instance, the book of Enoch in the 60th chapter, Enoch is talking about an event that shakes the heavens and disquiets the host of heaven. And when he is ha you know, talking about this, he is standing next to the throne of God. And he's looking at this incredible host that comes to the earth in the last days from the heavens. And he says that, <laughs> you can go and read this, this is the third verse of the 60th chapter says that he could no longer hold his loins. In other words, he's overcome by fear and he wets his pants, even though he is standing next to the throne of God for the things that he sees take place on the earth in the last days. Friends, there is a reason that in Luke chapter 21, um, the beginning of verse 26, it says that men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. When we're talking about seeing signs and wonders in the last days, friends, we are not talking about seeing solar eclipses. Those are cool. Those are religious experiences. Uh, if you have ever seen one, you know what I'm talking about. But those have happened with regularity ever since the world began. We're talking about things that shake us to our core. The events of the last days are going to be a test of an incredible magnitude. The scriptures say that few people will pass this test. The faith of most people will collapse in light of what is coming. And the book of Enoch is meant to prepare us in advance for what is coming, for what is happening, in a way, frankly, that no other book uh, does. The book of Revelation comes pretty darn close, but uh, the book of Enoch is next level compared to that. So, you know, if, if this sounds like a conspiracy theory to you, then don't waste your time. Uh, with my book, uh, The Book of Enoch, because not only do I talk about these events in The Book of Enoch from a scriptural perspective, and friends, The Book of Enoch was considered scripture by the early church. There can be no doubt about that. Peter quotes it throughout um, first and, his first and second epistle. Uh, John the Revelator quotes from the book of Enoch in the first chapter of his writings. Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. I mean, here you've got three of the original 12 apostles. You've got two members of the first presidency of the uh, 12 apostles that are talking about these things. Um, the Doctrine and Covenants section 107 states that the book of Enoch will be testified of in due time. Friends, the book of Enoch is meant to be studied by us. Most people dismiss it because it reads like a conspiracy theory. I cannot deny that. Uh, it does. It's weird. I can't do a, a video or I won't do a video uh, about the details of the book of Enoch because I think that doing so would be a hurdle to people rather than helpful. Sure, those those of you that have read all of my books, you know, and are and are all in would would eat these things up, but you are a very small minority. And 
you know, I just, I hope that for people that are watching this video who have never, never read anything of mine, you know, the only thing that they've done is, is listen to other videos. Um, the Book of Enoch can be read for free online. There's a, there's a, a website, <clears throat> sacredtexts.com, <clears throat> something like that. You can get on there and you can read the Book of Enoch um, from R.H. Charles, which is absolutely hands down the best translation of the Book of Enoch that there is. You can read it for free. When you read it, um, I want you to think about, I want you to read it in the context of the covenants that the Lord has made in the Old Testament, particularly with the house of Israel. And when you do, and honestly, this is what I have tried to lay the groundwork for in, in all of my other books that I have written. All of those books are intensive in the scriptures. I mean, a remnant shall return. I literally go through over a thousand different scriptural references. And by the way, you can listen to a remnant shall return for free anywhere you can listen to podcasts. Just look up a remnant shall return, Michael Rush, second coming, something like that. The book will come up. You can listen to the whole thing for free online. You're not going to be able to listen to the book of Enoch for free online. Um, it's, it is, and that's because it is a very different uh, book. And, you know, I, I think that it will be very helpful um, to those who believe these men that are speaking in Congress, believe that what they're saying is actually true. If you don't believe what they're talking about, if you think that they're just crazy, if, um, don't waste your time on the book of Enoch. You've got you should be listening to a remnant, you know, shall return instead. Um, you get, get some groundwork uh, for these things. But uh, I mean, this book is available uh, for those that want it on my website, uh, thelost10tribes.com. Uh, the audio book is available right now. Um, I'm only listing the audio book combo uh, on there. And the physical copy of the book probably won't mail out until the middle of September, but the audio book um, will be available as soon as you, you know, order the book. In the order confirmation, there will be a little box that says download now. Just click on it and download it now and you can start listening to it, you know, even though there will be a slight you know, delay of a couple of weeks before the actual book, physical copy of the Book of Enoch arrives um, because they're you know, they need to be uh, printed and then uh, 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 shipped out. So, <clears throat> friends, I, I, I hope that you will think about the things that, regardless of whether or not you're going to read my book, I hope that you will consider the things that these men have testified of before Congress. Also, in June... Dr. Stephen Greer did a disclosure project uh, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where he had other whistleblowers. Um, I think it's like a three-hour presentation. You can uh, go online and watch that for free. You need to be able to reconcile these kinds of things with your understanding of the events of the last days. And if you can't, you don't understand the events of the last days. Everything that I have talked about in my other videos and my other books, the fact that the whore of Babylon is real, the fact that there will be an antichrist of unbelievable power who will be godlike, who will do miracles in the eyes of all nations, and who will absolutely decimate faith, that is absolutely real. It is not figurative. We're not talking about a general feeling of Antichrist. We're talking about a man who overcomes the saints of God for a season. When I talk about the fact that Israel will be restored 
and that that restoration will rival the exodus of Egypt, it all ties in. When I talk about the fact that reality is not what we think it is, that at its core, we believe in a supernatural God, and that reality is fundamentally supernatural. Everything that our religion is based on is at its core supernatural. If you can't get your mind around these four things, then I'm sorry, but you just are not going to make it. Um, these things are going to shake you too much. They're going to, frankly, they're going to shake everybody, regardless of what you understand. This is why your President Nelson says, listen, unless you have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, you will not survive the events of the last days. And the Holy Ghost is a lot trickier than most people understand. It is a still, small voice. It is the hardest voice of all the voices that are out there. Every other voice is loud and proud. It rings in our ears. We cannot help but hear those messages. The still small voice is very quiet. It's one of the reasons that so few are going to, you know, make it. But, you know, the, the Lord is merciful. He is far more merciful than we understand, than we're ready to accept, than we're willing to accept. The plan of salvation is just that. It's a plan of salvation. And whereas the events that will take place on the last days are going to be terrifying, they will also be absolutely incredible to witness. And all of the prophets of the, you know, that foresaw the events of the last days, they longed to see them. And, <clears throat> and some of them have even explicitly stated, listen, the people that will live to see these events are more blessed than those that do not. So in other words, to have these days be your days, it speaks to who you are. And you were reserved to come forth in these days for a very special reason. And you can make it. All of us can make it. But in order to do that, we need to listen to the Holy Ghost. And just look at the world today. We all started on the same page at one point. Religion was the same for all of us. We were taught by messengers from God and we all accepted the same truth. And now everybody accepts different truths and everybody is sure in what they believe and people's ears are becoming even itchier and we're believing stranger and stranger things. And, you know, it's, this is going to accelerate. Confusion will accelerate. And, you know, I, I believe, I honestly believe that the Book of Enoch is a tremendous resource. It's, it's a survival guide for the events of the last days. And, you know, I have written volume one of the Book of Enoch, you know, which for those of you that are interested, and I know that it's going to be a very small, <laughs> percentage of the population that's interested. Um, and yeah, that's, that's fine. But I do believe that, you know, when the Lord was talking about being the salt of the earth, it takes very little salt to change things. And I believe that it will take very few people who understand the events of what's going on to make an incredible difference. And I hope that the Book of Enoch will, or let me say my interpretation of the Book of Enoch, you know, my volume one through the first uh, 38 um, chapters will be beneficial to you in your preparations of the last days because our preparations, above all, they must be spiritual for what is, what is about to take place on the earth. Friends, um, I know this has been an unusual video the Book of Enoch is a very unusual book. Uh, 
I hope that uh, for those of you that uh, will actually uh, read it, uh, I hope that it will be a blessing in your life. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Feel free to reach out to me uh, at michael at thelostintribes.com. God bless, friends, uh, and we'll talk to you later.